Hello again and welcome to Four Wheels Good. This week we'll be taking a modern stroll down memory lane, worshipping at the temple of TBR and catching up with one formula for fitness at the Jordan Racing Team's HQ. But first, I've been taking a look at the unscrupulous world of clocking. Clocking is a con as old as the hills. This is just one way of doing it, but whichever method you use, it boils down to the same thing. Tampering with the mileage to make the car more attractive and more valuable to a gullible buyer. These days, of course, the instruments on many cars are electronic, but does that mean they can't be altered? And if they can, how's it done? I'm off to North Staffordshire to find out. In essence, it's easier to adjust a digital dashboard than it is a mechanical one. Colin, I can see from the screen that your software covers most, if not all, cars. Yeah, the, uh, the software covers about 95% of the vehicles currently on the market. As you can see there, it's, uh, we've got BMW, Jag, Mercedes, Renault, Volkswagen, etc. But not all as easy to do as the BMW 3 Series, though? No, the, the 3 Series is the, uh, the most uh, easiest one to do at the moment. Um, all others uh, have to come out, the dashboard has to come out. But they're relatively uh, straightforward to, to strip down. I mean, this is um, out of a VW Golf and uh, several screws and the back comes off, gives you direct access to the memory device. This one looks a bit more complicated. This one, this is a Jaguar. This is from the, uh, the later, the current uh, Jaguar ones and uh, this one is, uh, the actual mileage is housed within uh, a microprocessor. And again, we, we build a clip that goes on there and we can read out the original mileage and, uh, and recalibrate it. The equipment was uh, built and designed to uh, help repair uh, digital dashboards. Um, but obviously there's also uh, other reasons or elements that it can be used for. Um, in general, I mean, if, you, uh, if the dashboard is faulty, uh, corrupt, or you want to replace it for a, a second-hand one, then the original mileage can be restored. Now, some would say that, that sounds dodgy. Um, there's uh, two ways of looking at it, uh, you know, in, in two lights you can look at it. Uh, we sell it for the repair of dashboards, but uh, obviously some people may purchase it for other activities. But um, the, the dashboard itself, recalibration, is, is certainly not illegal. We are very angry about it. We feel that we are a respectable industry and the majority of us wouldn't dream of doing this. And I, is, I understand that over 70% of the clocking incidents are done actually by private individuals. How has the problem been exacerbated by the way we buy our cars these days? Well, if a lease company car is on a three-year lease, you have stipulated what mileage you will do. Say over that period you'll do 60,000 miles. If you've done 70,000 miles, there is a penalty to pay i.e. for a volume franchise car it's probably £25 per thousand but if it's a prestige car it's probably £150 per thousand so they've got a lot of money to gain by having their cars wound back by that 10,000 miles. The normal uh, person in the street is more than likely to do it uh, than the trader. The trader with uh, heavy penalties involved these days will, will quite literally get summoned for it. We've established that adjusting the mileage itself is not illegal but then you do get into sticky problems if you don't inform the next buyer, don't you? It is up to the, uh, the, the person who owns the vehicle to disclose that information upon resale. If he doesn't, then uh, there's, there's grey areas of the law when you can probably get um, prosecuted for um, uh, obtaining money by deception and also the, uh, the Trades Description Act. Trading standards are extremely concerned that, about the fact that people are either offering the services or offering the means by which uh, other people can make these reductions on computerised odometers. So the watchdogs will be more on their guard in the future. But what extra teeth could be given to the authorities? Sue Brownson's got a few ideas. We would very much like a law to be passed that you cannot clock your car and that it is actually something that you will be prosecuted for find a lot of money and perhaps go to prison. Always, always insist on full documentation, the V5 form and a full service history. If they are genuine, they will tell the real story. If you've any doubts, walk away. Don't forget, clocking has become more sophisticated, but so have the ways of detecting it. And if you're tempted, remember, if you get caught passing on a clocked car, the law will be on your trail. A very real problem there, so don't get caught out. Now, have you ever thought of buying a stylish old vehicle that'll make heads turn and tongues wag, but decided the upkeep would be just too much? Well, 
Those days of indecision may well be over. The Asquith Motor Carriage Company will build something for you with the body hailing from a golden age and the roar of a Ford Transit engine. The Asquith Motor Carriage Company have hit upon a niche market that creates replica old vehicles that really turn heads. And this is just what the companies who commission them to make them want. Used as promotional or marketing tools at trade or public fairs, they're mobile adverts which are practical as well. The marketing man likes it because it does help promote and sell a product. The financial director also likes the vehicle because he will find that once the vehicle is, say, four or five years old, we can prove that they're always being sold for at least what they cost when new. So he will get his money back, so he's interested in that aspect. And the marketing man's had free advertising, if you like, over that period to help promote and sell his product. Perhaps the most exciting one is in Japan, where Coca-Cola have modern mobile vending vehicles selling product. And they've been able to prove over the years that more than three times the number of people buy from an Asquith type of vintage-style van, if you like, than who buy from a normal modern van. Asquith must be the only vehicle manufacturer who still employs skilled carpenters, leather trimmers and sign writers old skills are married to new technologies as the chassis and running gear usually is a Ford Transit for modern day reliability, economy and ease of service. From underneath, the vehicles look like any other Transit. On top, the glass fibre body and period style interiors transform and delight. The future looks very exciting for us with two brand new products. The taxi is a proper London black cab and it has to conform to the very stringent conditions that the black cabs have to realise in the UK. A 25-foot turning circle, for example, wheelchair access, those are two of the main things that you have to have. We've also produced a limousine version of the same one with the fold-down hood and inside you have TVs and videos or bar cabinets or just whatever anybody wants. <laughs> Who says old cars can't go fast? But if it's real speed you want, look no further than Blackpool. Ginny Buckley recently took a seaside trip to a grand meeting of TVR owners and overseeing the whole event, none other than Trevor TVR Wilkinson. One cold Sunday morning, a group of people from every imaginable walk of life gather together. What could they have in common? Well, they're all TVR owners, and they've got together to wander around what may seem at first something like a scrapyard. But it isn't. It's a temple, the temple of TVR. <laughs> And with sales of around ooh, 1,700 a year, TVR owners are rather a rare breed. And so they like to get together once in a while and swap stories and admire each other's paint jobs. And what better place to do it in than the home of these low-down, snarling, performance-packed vehicles, Blackpool. Who do you think buys your cars? It is in totally impossible to pigeonhole a TVR buyer. Um, it goes from the, sort of the gilded youth, the 21-year-old who's got indulgent parents, right up to, I think we've, I think we've got a 78-year-old lady who has a TVR. So you've got a very wide spectrum of people. From your point of view, it must be nice to see this level of enthusiasm about your cars. It is lovely. I mean, 
actually underneath it all we're enthusiasts too so yes it's lovely actually to get together with a whole load of people and actually not have to be embarrassed about the fact that you want to talk about spring and damper rates and things like that it, no it's very nice to be able to get together with a lot of people who are sort of like-minded and talk cars talk tvrs in particular tvr owners have to remember that they're actually buying a handmade car from a company whose owner's dog once took a bite out of the chimera prototype and changed its shape forever TVR is not a regulation issue, and it may come with a reputation for always breaking down, for faulty electrics, for leaking more than a watering can. But to the true enthusiasts, that doesn't matter. It's all part of the charm. What do you say to people out there that say you're buying an overpriced kit car? Because some people do say that, don't they? I think if you're talking of a TVR of 20, 30 years ago, the might be true but today it's not. There's probably no difference in reliability if you were to go for something like a BMW or a one-off like a Maserati or whatever. They're a lot cheaper as well. So what about all the, the, the stories that float around about the electrics going wrong and they leak? What do you say? You've, you've obviously an owner. What do you agree with that or not? I've had one and after having a chimera beforehand they do have their quirks but uh, <laughs> that's the sort of thing you expect when you buy this sort of car. They are unique, they're all different. Uh, they're not a production car in as much as there's only about three or four guys that see the car when it goes down the line rather than 20 or 30 robots. So that's what we like when we're buying the car. What do you like about owning a TVR? Um, it's just, it's unique. It's a, it's a different type of car, you know. Um, I mean, I say mine's 24 years old and, you know, I love it. It has a few little niggles, little problems with it, but, you know, it's all part of having a, having a TVR. Well, you're getting a unique British-made hand-built car that um, is different, that is fun to drive, everybody uh, respects them, unlike with something like a Porsche, maybe people are a bit maybe jealous rather than respect, and it's just great fun. We um, spend all of our social time using it, and it's excellent. It's the exhaust note, really, that uh, allures people to them. And what about all the little quirks? Because I'll say quirks, you know, the, the windows that don't work. It's synchronies, really. Does you learn to live with them, and that's what you love about them. The TVR owners certainly love the quirks all right, and the quirks are there because each TVR is a handmade car. Every part of it moulded, engineered, polished, stitched and painted by hand in a little factory on a back street in Blackpool. Every single TVR is built to order and caters for the customer's eccentricities. There are over 12,000 colours for you to choose your TVR from. But hey, if you want it the same colour as your psychedelic ski boots, so be it. Trevor Wilkinson, the man who founded TVR, is just behind us. And there is a whole rush of TVR owners ready there waiting to kiss his feet. Honest. Here today, there's what, sort of 300 TVRs from the Owners Club. I mean, it's, it's known around the world, the company. And I know you're not directly involved with it anymore, but how does it feel, you know, to come and see all this? Well, it's, it's very uh, impressive. Uh, it's basically just the same that I was doing in the early days, except everything's on a much grander <laughs> scale. Uh, <laughs> Looking around the factory, do you not want to get in there and have a bit of a tinker? Yes. Yes, I would love to, yeah. I'd love to get a pair of overalls on and start again. <laughs> what do you think of the TVRs that are around now? What do you think of the, the you know, the Cerber and the Chimera? Well, I'd, it is hard to have a definite impression without driving them. But, uh, well, basically, I mean, to what we were building, I mean, they're now a fantastic car. Well, they're now a supercar, which was... Uh, virtually unheard of in the day when we, days when I first started. A lovely car, never mind the expenses. Well, that's it for part one. See you after the break when we'll be visiting the Jordan Racing Team's fitness centre and John Wright will be servicing a Volkswagen. Welcome back. You might not think it, but Formula One drivers need to be very fit. There are great strains on the body of a driver when he's in his F1 car, strains which most of us will never feel. So down at Jordan Racing, a strict new regime has been introduced. Formula One drivers require as high a level of fitness as any top athlete. 
The Formula One driver is a marathon athlete, requiring stamina rather than sprint capability. Although seated, all areas of the driver's body are put under fluctuating levels of strain and pressure, those which a normal person will never in a whole lifetime experience. At the same time, he must withstand the huge g-forces that driving a Formula One car entails, especially into the neck. The shoulders and upper body in general endure constant exertion through the force of energy required to simply point the car in the correct direction. Driver fitness has progressed in a similar fashion to that of the development of the cars themselves. Strict fitness programs are followed, with close attention also paid to diet. Barry Grinham is employed by Jordan Grand Prix as personal fitness instructor to the team. Here, Barry is concentrating on improving the fitness of the team's Italian driver, Giancarlo Fisichella. I got involved with Jordan five seasons ago. Okay, uh, I run a fitness facility right. in Oxford. And first of all, Eddie's wife came along, and then Eddie came along to the facility, and I, I didn't know who he was. And I started training with him. And he built this lovely factory that you see behind me and asked if I would install a fitness facility in there for the use of the drivers and for the staff, which I thought was great. Driver fitness is of paramount importance to the success of the team, a fact emphasised by team owner Eddie Jordan, who himself works out on a regular basis. Um, of course, it's clearly not obviously uh, just the performance of the car that's important on this. Uh, both the psychological and physical side of the driver is a key element in this. Uh, and it all forms part of the package in the driver uh, preparation, if you like. Um, the fitter they are, the better they are. Um, the performance is. And um, in our own case, we have a trainer dedicated to the team, Barry Grinham, who looks after our drivers, brings them to a specification that is acceptable at the beginning of the season, and then tones on that throughout the season, not necessarily in, in, in brute strength, but in terms of durable strength. Uh, the G-forces are something astronomical now with the car's performance, so the neck is a key area. But it is an overall fitness. No specific area needs to be toned more than the other, except just constant dedication to make sure you're at the best possible level. There's various forms of running which we do, but if you just take a, a, a basic run, then we'll go out early in the morning um, and we'll go to the parks or we'll go along the river and we'll do a steady state run, uh, which is basically for heart and lungs, cardiovascular efficiency. Um, we'll then break and we'll have some breakfast and then either late afternoon or early evening, we'll go to the gym and we'll do our resistance work where we've got a specific program um, for his, his body toning and to making sure that all the muscles are working effectively and efficiently and we've got enough strength there. Specific muscle groups require workouts to attain strength in areas that are of specific importance to a Formula One Grand Prix driver. Talking to the drivers, uh, the drivers that I've worked with, then you know they've got the stresses of the track, the track may be bumpy, going around the corners, they, they create a lot of g-force on the neck and on the shoulder area, so the muscles of the neck, the uh, erector muscles, the muscles, the stabilising groups of muscles, they come under considerable stress when they're driving. And also the, 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 the Formula One uh, circuit, most races are like two hours of duration. So it's an endurance type sport really. Uh, so if they're in a hot climate, they suffer with a lot of dehydration. So that has to be taken into consideration. But you know, they're, they're, at the, they're at the top, they're at the pinnacle and they're really pushing the car uh, as fast as they can. So concentration, everything has to be prime, has to be 100%. They can't be any lapses in any area of the uh, fitness umbrella, really. After a series of warm-down exercises and stretches, Giancarlo's training session finishes with a massage. Barry is pleased with the progress the young Italian has made so far. Giancarlo learns quickly and retains information well. We have got a good relationship, actually. He's a, he's a very good learner, which, which I like, obviously. If I show him a technique, he picks it up straight away. Uh, he concentrates, whereas I call it mirror imaging. I get on a machine and I say, I'd like you to do it this and I want you to do it this way. Whereas maybe someone else has shown him something different. So it gets a bit like Chinese whispers. But I get on and I show, I show him and I say, I want you to do it this way. You must do this technique. And he gets on and he, he, he just mirrors exactly what I was doing. And I only have to show him once or twice. And he remembers it. So he's been a, a very good pupil, ex excellent trainee. Oh yes, there's far more to racing than just driving fast. And you should bear that in mind when you fill out the application form. Well, now it's time for our regular visit to Inside Motors master John Wright, where this week he performs a whole service on a polo.
welcome once again to Inside Motors. Right, here's the new oil filter that we got from BMS. Now, before you fit it, two important points. One, pre-fill a little bit of oil in the filter. Just let it go over the top and lubricate the seal. That's all that cleaned up. Pop the new one back on. Just before I fit it, what I want to point out is that these two fil these two filters are of different sizes. Normally that would make a difference, apart from the fact that I do know that Volkswagen have changed the specification on oil filters and they've gone for a smaller spec one. So I know that that one's correct, even though I've taken that huge one off. Let's see if we can get this in with it. That's it. There we are. Now the filter face has just contacted the block and it needs three quarters of a turn to tighten it up. There we go. As viewers of Inside Motors will know already, I like to put the oil in in a jug. Uh, it's especially important with cars like this that have catalytic converters because if you overfill the sump, you risk serious damage to your catalytic converter. Right, I'll just pop two litres in there and I'm just going to see where it comes up to on the dipstick. It's just popped about halfway up the uh, max and min mark. We'll just put a little bit more in, I think. Right, there we go. We've finished the lubrication service as specified by Volkswagen in the manual. We used a 19mm spanner. We've used an oil filter wrench, one oil filter, and uh, five pounds worth of oil. Doing your car maintenance yourself is always easier than you think, and it really does save a packet. That's it for this week. Join us next time when we'll be devouring the road with a fantastic Ferrari F40, getting a design view of the Ford car or car, and taking a ride in the latest driving simulator. And don't forget to catch and watch our new sister programme, Motor Week. See you next week.